Vasily Sergeyevich Kulik was born on January 17, 1956 in Irkutsk. His father was a professor and entomologist, he worked at the Agricultural Institute, then at the Faculty of Biology at ISU, and tried to study literature. Mother was the director of school number 40 in Irkutsk. Vasily Kulik was the youngest of three children in the family. When he was born, his parents were already over 40 and, naturally, the mother's pregnancy and childbirth were difficult, there was a danger of fetal development abnormalities and complications for the mother herself. From the testimony of V. Kulik's mother, Fyodosia Stepanovna, Dr. Shergina, who consulted me, said that I couldn't give birth, that the one I gave birth to would not be human. I nevertheless decided to give birth, and my labor lasted from January 10 to January 17. They went under anesthesia. When I first saw the newborn, I was horrified, he was very small, without nails, his ears were depressed, his large belly was throbbing so that it seemed like it would burst. He was born premature, seven months old. He was not bathed until he was six months old, as his skin began to turn black from the water. It wasn't until he was six months old that he started to look like a baby. Initially, the newborn's body did not take food, and nutrients were administered artificially, intravenously. Only a month later, the mother and child were discharged from the maternity hospital, by that time he weighed only 2 kilograms 100 grams. 1957, from the testimony of V. Kulik's mother, less than a year old, he became seriously ill with measles, his father and I, taking turns, kept him in an upright position. As he lay there he was out of breath. From the age of one, he was sent to a nursery, from this age until the age of three he did not sleep every night. For about 1.5 years he tried to start a gramophone. They thought he was a sleepwalker, and my husband took him to Professor Sumbaf. He said that his son was simply inquisitive. My son continued to stay awake at night, didn't let me sleep, it annoyed me so much that I beat my son, my husband defended him. The father carried him in his arms through the streets at night, trying to calm him down and protect himself and his son from his mother's anger. And the mother practically did not approach her baby until he was two years old. Veji studied at secondary school number 13 in Irkutsk. Subsequently, he suffered from hepatitis twice, suffered from rheumatism, and until the age of 12 he was suffocating from bronchial asthma. He grew up extremely weakened. The mother's indifference gave way to excessive care. His sister testified, the family had a special attitude towards Vasily, everything was allowed and forgiven to him. He quickly realized this and grew up to be very selfish, sometimes to the point of cruelty. One day he grabbed a knife and ran after me, I barely had time to jump out of the room, slamming the door behind me, into which I heard the knife get stuck. From the mother's testimony, I myself am an educational psychologist by profession. Believe me, we did not spoil Vasily, we even punished him physically for his actions. They dressed modestly, didn't buy anything unnecessary, and didn't cooperate when he begged us for a moped in high school. He bought himself a tape recorder only after graduating from college and getting a job as a doctor. After graduation, his friend invited him to become a surgeon, but Vasily flatly refused, because due to his character he could not perform operations and he began working after the ninth grade, all summer as a janitor. We always kept animals in the house, a squirrel, a turtle, a dog, and a cat. He treated them very well. It seems that the mother did not know her son at all. Later it turned out that as a child, Kulik selflessly loved to torture cats, he would catch them in the yard and hang them with a friend. According to Kulik himself, one day the animal's last convulsions coincided with an unprecedentedly bright orgasm of a sadistic child. Then these sensations were reinforced more than once, and he persistently sought them in everyday life. At school, Vasily became interested in sports and was very successful in boxing, he received the first category. He had grown stronger and matured. 
In the early 70s, at regional competitions he took first place in the weight category up to 57 kilograms. At the next competition, he received a powerful knockout, was treated for a long time, was in the hospital, but everything turned out okay. He became interested in sex early and matured early. His first sexual experience was at school. From Kulik's testimony, as a schoolboy, I fell in love with one girl, slept with her, then found out that she had a good dozen people like me. As a student, I went out to harvest potatoes, and there I met a young married Bayat woman, who looked more like a boy, who taught me all the perversions. In a restaurant I met a woman who confidentially told me that she sleeps with her husband's lovers, they use her in the same way as their spouse. I had many mistresses, in recent years, about twenty, several at a time. I think I was influenced by female promiscuity. I was tired of women. I didn't have any fun with them. In 1974 to 1976, he did military service. And from 1976 to 1982 he studied at the Faculty of Medicine at the Medical Institute. From an interview with V. Kulik, we grew up in complete prosperity. I studied well at school and easily entered a state institute. At the institute, he not only devoted all his time to study, but also composed sleeping pills, which he then mixed into alcohol. These drugs were intended for classmates whom he invited to nature, and then even those of them who had previously refused Kulik's sexual advances could no longer resist. No one, however, reported it, remembering what happened after drinking badly. 1980, near the Central Market, teenage hooligans hit him on the head with a piece of pipe and robbed him. After this moment, Kulik began to desire children and was less and less attracted to women. From the testimony of V. Kulik, for the last five to six years after a head injury, I was regularly visited by thoughts of a sexual nature, where I perform indecent acts with children. At first I thought only about girls, then about boys, and also about old women. After a head injury, he first tried to seduce a child, a fourth grader Vaselina. He was twenty-four years old, she was nine. He wrote letters to her and gave her toys. When the period of courtship passed, he began inviting her to the attic, which he had chosen for his headquarters, he said how good and cosy it would be for them, how fun they would frolic and play. The girl did not go, either she had enough prudence, or he did not yet have enough experience in seducing young children. Six months later, Vaselina informed her mother about the courtship. Her mother reported it to the police. The police did not consider student Kulik a problem for society, and lost the notes he wrote to the girl. Kulik himself, analyzing this situation, gave the following testimony, I realized that in order to get pleasure, I needed my partner to be unfamiliar. Besides, why spend so much time on courtship if with the help of physical strength you can get everything at once? In 1981 he got married to future lawyer Marina, a girl from Severobakalsk. Marina was pleased with the secure position of his family, and she liked Vasily himself. From the testimony of Kulik's wife, Vasily gave the impression of a soft, weak-willed person, but this is not so. He was very purposeful, whatever he puts his mind to, he will definitely do it. He quickly lost interest in his wife, while having sex with my wife, I mentally desired little girls. In 1982 he graduated from the institute. From V. Kulik's diary, after college, I was assigned as a local therapist. I immediately understood, my business is extremely dangerous for the health, not so much of the population, but of mine. I started the following treatment system, for the head, analgin, for the throat, streptocide, for the heart, valadol and nitroglycerin, for the stomach, belladonna tablets, for blood pressure, papazol, from the liver, noshpa. I began to implement the system. First of all, the most seriously ill grandparents gave up and went into oblivion, adding to the irretrievable losses log of the site. It became easier. But there were still people who got to me. I had to dramatically change tactics. After interrogating the patients, I didn't immediately blurt out prescriptions and sick leave, I decided that there are also specialized specialists for this. At the same time, I take into account that a narrow specialist does not receive appointments every day, the queue for him is like a minister. 
But even if the specialist is not a mistake, then he sends those who broke through to him for a specific study. It is unknown when my sufferer will again appear on the threshold of my office. Pensioners are the strongest. It's easier with young people, while they run around all sorts of specialists and tests, you see, they'll recover. And if they fall, the ambulance will send them to the hospital, and everything will be off my shoulders. They don't take pensioners to the hospital, the ambulance will give them a stimulating injection, they are able to run again. Poor pensioners run around until they collapse somewhere on the street. And if they survive, there is a sure way to send them to the oncology clinic. Things are going well. I sit in the waiting room all day, writing good reports on the reduction in morbidity at the site. The most important thing in my business is for the patient to leave this mortal world not from the territory of the site, but to lie back somewhere on the street or in a hospital bed, then this is no longer my mistake. My unfortunate patients have fled to other district police stations. I don't envy whom the sick are rushing to see. They've lost weight, they're poor, they can't take the bets anymore. And the bosses always remember them with bad words, this is what being sincere towards the sick leads to. And the sincere police officers themselves very soon join the ranks of the sick. Luckily I avoided it. The beginning of his medical practice coincided with the beginning of his criminal path. In the spring of 1982, when his young wife was in the maternity hospital, on the way to his sister, he lured a little girl into a garage on Sinyushina Gora. The assault, conceived impromptu, happened. From then on, hunting took place impromptu, he wanted it and immediately received it. That was his game. Then, during the investigation, Kulik could not remember all the cases. Almost all of the first episodes of assaults named by Kulik were not proven. From an interview with V. Kulik, family life has been successful, my wife was a lawyer by training, we had two children, I love them very much. Now they have abandoned me. I didn't drink, didn't smoke, didn't spend an extra penny on myself. And then I went crazy. Today, even to myself, I can't explain when and why I snapped. I don't want to justify myself, but our world has always been terribly ugly, full of violence, cruelty. And now, more than ever, there are a lot of murders, video pornography reigns. I began to be embarrassed by children, teenagers, and their nudity. One day I decided. It was during the day. I met an eight-year-old girl at a tram stop, you know, a kind of modern accelerator, and I could not overcome the sudden wild desire to take possession of her. That autumn I had several such adventures with girls and boys. All cases had no consequences. The first episode that was proven and which opened Kulik's case was the assault of eight-year-old Masha, whom he knew. Waving, he let her go. And she identified him several years later. He also released the next one, eight-year-old Tanya. He also left the boy Tolia alive, who told his parents everything, but they were embarrassed to go to the police with him. Kulik selected boys and girls strictly based on their appearance. The rest, age, acquaintance with the parents of the tortured, and even the degree of one's own relationship with them, did not matter. If anything held him back, it was only the fear of being exposed. From the testimony of Kulik's mistress, he often went to bed with my son when I went to the kitchen. Vadik, my son, came running and complained, my uncle was trying to get to me, grabbing me for everything. I thought he was just caressing the boy and then grabbed him by chance. From Kulik's testimony, I tried to assault my three-year-old son twice when we were alone, but either my mother or my wife came home at that moment. From the testimony of Kulik's wife, my son complained to me that dad was interfering with him, I demanded an explanation. Vasily replied that he was simply treating a boil on his buttock. I calmed down. The desire to copulate with both of his sons possessed him to the end, but he found a way out, when he could no longer endure it, he went out into the street and caught his next victim. From an interview with V. Kulik, this thought began to occur to me in 1982. In my thoughts, I often imagined that I was killing my partner with a knife, but at the same time I did not imagine the sight of blood. In general, I gradually, over and over again, accustomed myself to the idea that I would have to kill my partner, strangle him, 
so that there would be no screaming. I have had cases where children started screaming in pain, and I left them in fright. Somehow, while working with another victim and overcoming her resistance, I strangled the girl a little. She began to agonize and convulse. This gave me a special feeling of sexual satisfaction. After this incident, I began to do this to all the victims. 1983, Kulik's father dies. Vasily was very worried about the death of his father, drank a bottle of Corvallo, lost consciousness at night, and suffered from convulsions. But they managed to take him to the poisoning center and barely pumped him out. It was on the eve of 1984, when Kulik turned into a cold-blooded, sadistic killer. From the testimony of V. Kulik, since 1984, I began to kill people who were objects of my sexual desires. During sexual intercourse, I choked them, felt a spasm of my partner's body, convulsions, and experienced great pleasure, unknown before. From that period, I ended sexual intercourse when my partner was already dead, that is, I killed my partner during sexual intercourse. March 1984 from Kulik's testimony, on the 20th of March 1984, at 10 a.m., I met on the street. Timuriasef, a 72-year-old woman who greeted me. I answered her and we started talking. It turned out that I had previously provided her with medical care as a doctor. In the conversation, I found out that she lives alone, and then I had the idea to assault her. She complained about her health, and I decided to give her an intravenous intoxicating injection. I, however, understood perfectly well that I would have to kill her, otherwise she would report to the police. When we arrived at her apartment, I measured her blood pressure, then administered a double dose of chlorpromazine intravenously. From this injection, a person becomes lethargic, weak, and falls into a semi-fainting state. I took the woman to the sofa and, putting her face down, began to rape her in a perverted form. A certificate from the Irkutsk Civil Registry Office registered the woman's death as a result of coronary heart disease, atherosclerosis and hypertension. The corpse was not opened. From Kulik's testimony, since the end of 1984, I began to compile a list of old women who interested me, I even had a special notebook, field diary. Parameters, the old woman should be lonely, live without sharing a room, in a separate apartment, know me and treat me kindly, often I mentally replayed sexual scenes in my head related to how I had sexual contact with these patients, but, being in the company of people, I realized the wrongness of my intentions, and drove these thoughts away from myself. And when I was alone, the thoughts came again. If I wanted, I could realize quite a lot of ideas based on a large list of old women. I also had a list of young single women whom I visited as an emergency doctor. They invited me to come in, but since there was no place for them in my sexual fantasies, I never went to any of them. The entire payroll remained alive. The first murder was followed by six more, however, the death of the old women did not cause strong emotions, they could die themselves, some of the bodies were not even properly examined. And when a knife and a pusher were found in the body of 53-year-old T. In intimate places, they decided that the woman was engaged in self-satisfaction. Kulik placed his other already dead victim in a bath of water. But at that time there had been no hot water in the house for a month. It turns out that the old lady decided to soak in a cold bath. One of the old women, after the doctor's visit, even went to the police to report an assault. But Kulik told the police that he was a doctor and came to give an injection. No criminal case was opened. The criminal left behind a lot of evidence, and among them the most important, by which forensic biological examination determines blood type, age and other data that helps the investigation but local experts were not up to the task either. Thus, all seven murders of elderly women were attributed to natural causes, no criminal cases were initiated on these facts. From V. Kulik's testimony, as for the children, I didn't keep a list, everything turned out improvised. In my thoughts, I often replayed scenes related to children, imagining them in specific places in Irkutsk, which I had studied well in infancy. Finding myself in these places, already in reality, I saw a child who satisfied my fantasies, and did with him what I had dreamed about. May 1984, the first murder of a child. 
Kulik was returning from his sister's apartment, where he spent a day with his mistress. I saw a girl sitting in the yard. Completely alone. Looks eight to nine years old. His favorite age. He came up and offered to play hide and seek. Bored Larissa S. agreed. Her corpse, with signs of beatings and numerous abrasions, was found a few days later in one of the basements in the center of Irkutsk. The girl's corpse horrified even experts. From Kulik's testimony, the girl resisted too actively. The examination recorded that death was due to asphyxia. The police began the search for the criminal by checking former criminals previously convicted of similar crimes. Citizen Levchenko, a former criminal and neighbor of the murdered girl Larissa, was detained because sunglasses, a diplomat, and a red shirt were found in his house, which were of interest to the investigation. Citizen Drozd was arrested in 1984, he wanted to make a confession regarding the assault that took place on Ryabikov Boulevard in order to alleviate his guilt. Nevertheless, the killing of children continued. In winter, the body of seven-year-old Andre Fermin was found. Again the corpse was found in one of the basements in the center of Irkutsk. As it turned out later, Kulik's friend worked as a mechanic, had the keys to the basements and gave them to his friend at his request. Again there were traces of rape, the child's death was due to asphyxia, in addition, a shoe print was found on the child's thigh. The last time Andre was seen was when he was sliding down an ice slide. Kulik's youngest victim was two years and seven months. The grandmother dressed the girl for a walk and put her on the porch while she worked with her eldest granddaughter. When the grandmother looked out onto the porch again, there was no one there. The girl's parents had to literally beg the police department on duty to quickly send an operational team to the scene of the incident. The operatives did not attach serious importance to these calls and arrived at the house only a few hours after the girl went missing. The police thoroughly searched the house and, for some reason, rewrote the furniture. A snowball was falling on the street, the dog didn't follow the trail further than the yard. Some time later, the next victim, this time a child, was killed in his own apartment. A mother, coming home from work for lunch, discovered the naked corpse of her daughter hanging from jump ropes in the children's room. When the operatives arrived, they found no signs of a break-in, the girl opened the door herself. Kulik's behavior during the murders underwent changes, he had new fantasies that needed to be brought to life. 1985 Another ambulance duty brought a lot of trouble, we had to save a woman in labor who had given birth right in the car. The tired and worried Kulik was warmly thanked by her relatives, and in a blissful mood, having passed his shift, he showed up at the long-planned address, to 75-year-old Sage. She was surprised, but Kulik managed to find the right words to explain his early appearance. After measuring the pressure, Kulik said that we needed to give an injection. A double dose of chlorpromazine immediately put the old woman to sleep. He assaulted and killed her with a knife. First, I couldn't figure out my feelings, what's more pleasant, to joke or stab? A terrible dilemma completely took possession of him, a repeated experiment was required, and he was already trying not to part with the knife, carrying it in a diplomat along with syringes. However, when in the summer of 1985 he was on vacation in Kirovograd, Ukraine, he did not have a knife with him. From the testimony of V. Kulik, in the summer of 1985, when I assaulted and killed a girl in Kirovograd, after that I regretted that I did not have a knife to dismember her corpse, and there was no suitable tool for this purpose. I believe that this brought me some new additional pleasure. From that moment on, a new element appeared in my thoughts, I dismember the corpses of my victims into pieces. By the end of 1985, there were already five unsolved murders of young children involving sexual violence, but the Irkutsk police did not have any definite assumptions about who the killer was. However, the forensic examination showed that all the dead, girls and boys, were subjected to perverted sexual acts. Sperm matching the group was found on the bodies of the victims. This fact, as well as an inspection of the crime scenes, gave reason to believe that all these crimes were committed by one person. In addition, the police had testimonies from witnesses, mostly children, whom the alleged criminal was trying to win over. He promised some sweets and ice cream, 
and some he promised to show the underground zoo and play hide and seek. During the investigation, Kulik said that not all the children willingly went with him. Some resolutely and immediately refused. According to the descriptions available to the police, which were posted on the streets of Irkutsk, they were looking for a man approximately 25 to 30 years old, above average height, thin, wearing glasses, with a speech impediment. He could be dressed in a dark coat and carry a briefcase. January 17, 1986. It's Friday, the weekend is ahead. In the Kulikov apartment they are preparing to celebrate Vasily's 30th birthday, and the owner of the house, excited after seeing his son's bath, found an excuse to leave the apartment, he said that he would go to the bakery to buy bread for a family celebration, but on the way he decided to make himself a special one. The gift is to assault and kill a child. He actually found a suitable boy in a bakery, where they bought bread together. Then he took him to a construction site on Timuryasev Street. The boy resisted, and Kulik did not have time to persuade him, the celebration was about to begin at home. Kulik forcibly dragged Seyosha Nazarov into a house under construction, covered his mouth with his palms so that he could not scream and squeezed his throat, causing the boy to lose consciousness. Then he began to undress him. But Kulik, excited and in a hurry to celebrate his own birthday, forgot to be careful, and the fact that a strange man led a seven-year-old boy into an empty building under construction was noticed by the cook of the canteen of the Agricultural Institute, Galina Goriankina. She told her colleagues about this, accountants Tatyana Andrianova and Tamara Veselovskaya, who went to the building where the man and the boy had disappeared. Slowing down their pace near the house, they, without saying a word, went in different directions and, stealthily, silently walking around the building, looked into every window, unsuccessfully trying to see something in the dark room. The silhouette of a man, kneeling in a bent state, and a half-naked boy lying on the floor was first noticed by T. Andrianova. She called out to the man. He began to say that he was a doctor, that he entered the building under construction out of natural need. And there he found a half-naked child. Being a doctor, he, of course, made an immediate attempt to bring the boy to consciousness. A woman saw him doing this, but she didn't want to listen to anything and screamed. Kulik jumped out the window and rushed to run towards the fence enclosing the construction site. Passers-by who were standing at a stop nearby rushed after him, Nikolai Modinov, chairman of the Dosov Bokansky District Committee, and his fellow villager, Ilya Hongodorov. They were going home to Oost Order. Modinov managed to catch Kulik by the leg trying to climb over the fence in time, and a serious struggle unfolded between them. At this time, the second pursuer, Ihon Godorov, climbed onto the fence and hit the man on the glasses, which flew off him in a splash of broken glass. The fugitive immediately stopped resisting, he was pulled from the fence and taken to the police station in the bus station building, which was located nearby. After this, the suspect was taken to the Kirov District Police Department. The next day, Kulik wrote a statement addressed to the prosecutor of the Irkutsk region and, during interrogation, outlined the circumstances of the murders of elderly women and young children he committed, involving assault, from his testimony it became clear that he had already committed thirty similar crimes. And in fourteen cases the victims were killed by him. He also showed the places where his crimes were committed, which coincided with the data from the inspection protocols of these places, were confirmed by the results of expert research and other case materials, for the investigation of which a solid investigative and operational group was created. However, during interrogations, Kulik did not give the investigators any additional information other than what was already known to the investigation at that time, Kulik constantly evaded the details of the crimes and hid the circumstances preceding the commission of murders and rapes. In particular, he did not reveal to the investigation the ways and methods of his contacts with victims, the methods of luring minors to places inaccessible to people, the very mechanism of the crimes, their sexual side, the sequence of actions after the commission of crimes. Such important investigative actions as checking testimony on the spot, identifications, confrontations, etc., were carried out at a very low professional level. Serious violations were also committed in the appointment of various examinations. 
Kulik's mother also unwittingly helped hide the truth. When, having detained Kulik, the police raided his apartment, seized knives and some cartridges, the mother, feeling stressed, took her son's diary from the refrigerator, where he wrote down the names of his victims and described in detail, down to the quality of an orgasm, what he had done, and read his. The family did not practice reading other people's diaries, and he did not hide his chronograph. This case was an exception. After reading, the mother burned this diary. Which is what she later told the investigation, she burned it because no one was supposed to read it. As a result, it turned out that the case at that time was based in fact only on the confession of Kulik himself, made immediately after the arrest, there was nothing objectively established in it, except for the last case when Kulik was caught red-handed. And in such an unfinished form, Kulik's case was sent to the Irkutsk Regional Court. The case was heard in court in March 1987. Having received the case for review and consulted with his lawyer, Kulik renounced all his testimony in court, citing the fact that he was forced, due to certain circumstances, to incriminate himself. And the reason turned out to be that Kulik himself, and his late father, and the whole family became the object of close attention of criminal blackmailers. Once upon a time, back during the war, while in Ukraine, Kulik's father made a cache in which he hid several German machine guns along with ammunition. And one day in the company of friends I let it slip. After some time, he was visited by a man who reported that this weapon had been found and used in an attack on collectors. The man demanded money, threatening to expose him. And the father was forced to pay for his silence. After his death, the blackmailers turned their attention to his son, Vasily Kulik, threatening to kill his family. It got to the point that Vasily simply tracked down and killed three of this gang. But then the remaining bandits began to blackmail him with the dead, which they promised to report to the relevant authorities. So one of their demands was, he must take upon himself all the rapes and murders that they committed, and they told him about each crime in detail and even showed him where it happened, what, when. With all these confessions he should have appeared before the investigative authorities. What added a special charm to this action movie was the fact that the leader of the gang invented by Kulik was called Chibis. So, the duel of the feathered Kulik against Chibis, it was difficult to believe in this fantastic story, however, the mistakes made by the investigator and significant gaps in the case material served as the reason for sending the Kulik case for additional investigation. In this regard, in 1987, by order of the then Deputy Regional Prosecutor Yuri Chaika, a new investigative team was created, headed by one of the best investigators, Nikolai Kitiev. Soon, Kulik's case, at the direction of the Union Prosecutor's Office, was transferred to the investigative unit of the RSFSR Prosecutor's Office, and Russian Prosecutor S. Yemelyonov sent an investigator for particularly important cases, I.M., to Irkutsk. Kostov for a detailed study of this complicated case. Kostov who at the same period of time led the Operation Forest Belt to capture the Rostov maniac Chikatilo, without taking the case into his proceedings, actively joined in organizing the work together with the existing group, a plan for additional investigative and operational search activities was drawn up, thanks to which it was possible find new victims of the maniac, Oksana S. and Svetlana P., whom in the fall of 1983 Kulik lured into one of the basements and assaulted them. Kulik mentioned these children at the first stage of the investigation, but then it was not possible to find them. This circumstance, if used tactically correctly, could radically change the course of the case and help prove Kulik's guilt. In addition, numerous examinations were carried out, speech therapy, biomechanical, histological, trisiological results, the results of which were used as the basis for proving Kulik's guilt. Thus, bit by bit, a solid evidence base was formed, convincingly demonstrating the inconsistency of Kulik's arguments about the alleged self-incrimination on his part. The time has come for the interrogation of the accused with the presentation of the entire complex of collected evidence. The investigators prepared especially carefully for this interrogation. The specialist was provided with photocopies of the case materials containing information about Kulik's personality from the moment of his birth. Using this information, 
Scientific Calculations and the Biocalculator of the Japanese Scientist Tatai, Shaposhnikova determined Kulik's biorhythm for the next three months. The specialist expressed the opinion that the most fruitful verbal contact with Kulik could take place in the middle of next June. Taking this into account, Kulik was summoned for interrogation in the morning of June 15, 1987. The interrogation was carried out jointly by Kitiev and Kostaev, who had flown in from Moscow. The interrogation began not with the episodes that had already been presented to him at one time, but only in relation to new victims found recently. Moreover, at the same time, investigators constantly returned to his untenable legend, which he invented for himself. Identifications and confrontations were carried out, the accused was presented with the results of examinations, which irrefutably pointed to him. On the fourth day of continuous interrogation, Kulik fully admitted his guilt in committing the crimes charged against him. He stated that in the presence of such a complex of convincing evidence, it makes no sense for him to continue to shut himself up and mislead the investigative authorities. Moreover, he reported committing several more crimes that investigators were not aware of and this information was confirmed during the audit. A number of events were carried out again, field visits, including those based on newly discovered circumstances, but in detail, in small things, facts were restored based on his testimony that the newly identified victims themselves forgot about or did not name. The matter was saved. He did not change the truthful testimony that Kulik gave in June until the end of the investigation. He confirmed them during the trial, fully admitting his guilt. On August 11, 1988, the court sentenced Kulik to death. But he remained on death row for almost a year. He kept a diary, wrote poetry, and willingly gave interviews. Journalists filmed him on death row, where he talked about the meaning of life. On June 26, 1989, the sentence was carried out. Vasily Kulik was 33 years old. 